All right, so here we're going to talk about osteoarthritis. This is super common, so you should expect to see this uh, weekly, if not daily, if you're practicing internal medicine. So overview of osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is a chronic, progressive, non-inflammatory, idiopathic, degenerative joint disease. So chronic in that these patients, when they're diagnosed with osteoarthritis, they'll live with it forever. It's progressive in that it gets worse over time. It's non-inflammatory, meaning that we don't have overt inflammation of the uh, synovium. However, uh, there is... A role of inflammation. It's not macroscopic like in rheumatoid arthritis or in septic arthritis, but there's a degree of inflammation. It's it's not important as far as we're concerned from a uh, medical practice standpoint. Uh, and it's idiopathic and degenerative, meaning that we don't know what causes it and uh, it degenerates the joint over time. There are some causes of osteoarthritis that we know. Those would be the secondary uh, osteoarthritis. So osteoarthritis is closely related to the aging process, and that's the primary uh, uh, osteoarthritis, and that's the arthritis that just comes with time. Other arthropathies can predispose to osteoarthritis. So if you have uh, chronic gout or rheumatoid arthritis or a chronic septic arthritis, for instance, that can predispose you to developing a secondary osteoarthritis, which is secondary to those types of arthritis. Uh, weight is a common cause of secondary osteoarthritis. So we have an obesity problem in this country. So that's why we see a much higher rate of osteoarthritis than uh, perhaps developing countries. Another common cause of uh, secondary osteoarthritis would be uh, different uh, um, different vocations. So let's say a mechanic who's down on their knees and getting up and sitting down all the time, uh, they could get knee osteoarthritis. Uh, a, a baseball pitcher could get elbow osteoarthritis and so forth. And osteo osteoarthritis affects over 20 million people in the United States and is a common cause of disability. So that's just an overview of osteoarthritis and uh, its mechanisms and the role it plays in our society. So slicing osteoarthritis, uh, let's break it down into uh, its categories. So systemic, no, it is not systemic. Primary osteoarthritis is not associated with any systemic symptoms. So osteoarthritis is not a systemic disease. The location, primarily osteoarthritis, is in the hands and in the weight-bearing joints. So in the hands, it could be in any joint, the wrist, the metacarpal phalangeals, the proximal interphalangeals, and the distal interphalangeals. If you recall uh, to rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis does not affect the distal interphalangeals, whereas osteoarthritis affects all of the joints of the hands. The weight-bearing joints, primarily we're talking the hips and the knees. And osteoarthritis does not have to be symmetrical. It may very well be, but it doesn't have to be. As far as inflammation, the joints are not externally inflamed. However, the treatment we use are anti-inflammatory drugs, so that goes to show you there is some level of inflammation, but no, the joints are not externally inflamed. And even as far as the synovial fluid, there's no signs of, of white blood cell inflammation there. Chronicity, this is a chronic and progressive disease. It gets worse over time. It has an insidious onset. And most importantly, osteoarthritis worsens with activity. The more a person gets up and down off their knees, the person with osteoarthritis, the worse the pain is going to be. Once they sit down, the pain starts to improve. And that stands in contrast with rheumatoid arthritis. Evidence of trauma, osteoarthritis, as mentioned, can occur secondary to acute or, sec uh, acute or chronic trauma to a specific joint, but primary osteoarthritis is not associated with any particular trauma. Okay, so osteoarthritis. What does the patient with osteoarthritis look like? So these patients, of course, their primary complaint, they tend to present with joint pain, hand pain, wrist pain, knee pain particularly. These patients tend to be older. They're almost always 50 or older. Obesity, joint trauma, repetitive joint work, uh, 
And other arthropathies are all risk factors for osteoarthritis as far as secondary osteoarthritis, but just being old puts you at risk for a primary osteoarthritis. Usually, the majority of patients are primary osteoarthritis, so this is usually an idiopathic disease. Patients will often complain and uh, pain in their knees and hands and hips. The important thing to delineate here is that in osteoarthritis, there is an absence of constitutional symptoms. So unless there's secondary osteoarthritis, there's another arthropathy that's giving way to osteoarthritis, which would be way more complicated than the USMLE would throw at you. An osteoarthritis question, these patients will have an absence of constitutional symptoms. So these pa patients will not have a fever. They won't have out of the ordinary fatigue or malaise. Now, in the clinical setting, if you ask the patient, do you have any fatigue or tiredness or malaise? Yeah, of course the patient might say, yeah, I'm tired because their joints hurt. It's hard for them to get up. But it's not out of the ordinary fatigue or malaise. On physical exam, looking at the joints, they tend to appear normal in early osteoarthritis. However, in progressive osteoarthritis, they may have nodes on the distal interphalangeal and proximal interphalangeal, and I'll show you a point or a picture of what those look like. Joints with osteoarthritis tend to have decreased range of motion, and when I say decreased range of motion, I mean both passive and active range of motion. And another thing you'll see, particularly in the knee joints and in the finger joints, is crepitus. So when you're actually uh, passively flexing or extending the joint, what you'll feel is some kind of resistance, like uh, kind of like uh, like uh, Rice Krispies, that sort of crepitous, bubbly feeling. And what that is is bone on bone. So that's that's uh, in indicative of osteoarthritis. So crepitus, decreased range of motion. Uh, are physical exam signs of osteoarthritis. However, joints will externally uh, generally appear normal unless they have those nodes, which I'll show you. When you suspect osteoarthritis, when you have outwardly appearing normal joints but uh, symptoms of osteoarthritis, the best first step in diagnostic examination is going to be an x-ray of that joint. And the typical finding is going to be a reduction in the joint space. Now remember, if you have an inflamed joint, a red, warm, erythemic, hot joint, then you're going to be getting a, uh, a synovial fluid analysis. But when the joint is outwardly normal, you're going to be getting an x-ray of the affected joint. Any labs that are given to you should be normal. Uh, these patients should not have elevated white counts. They shouldn't have elevated uh, ESRs. They should be otherwise normal. Abnormalities in labs should make you think of some other precipitating factor other than primary osteoarthritis. So this is a normal knee x-ray. You have the femur and the tibia and the fibula here. And then I want you to pay special attention to this joint space here. So this joint space, uh, you're not really paying as much attention to how big the joint space is as much as you're paying attention to how uh, how fluent the joint space is. So it's approximately the same space from one side of the uh, joint to the other. Now here is a, an x-ray of a knee in osteoarthritis. We have our normal one here still on the left. And now here you can see, yes, there is a narrowing, but there's different ranges of joint space from one end to the other. So you've got bone on bone here, you've got a narrow joint space here. It's not this uh, very confluent joint space that we have uh, in the normal joint. Here again you see more, uh, this is less severe than the one on the left here, but again you see uh, a reduced joint space uh, here and not so much here, but uh, you do have a reduced joint space. And then here is a, an example of uh, the same patient progressed over 19 years. So relatively normal starting out and then over time they progress. Here's a normal hip x-ray. Again, the joint space is confluent. Now here's uh, a hip in osteoarthritis. You can see the hip on the left here looks pretty normal but the hip on the right 
here is reduced joint space and even some fibrosis between the head of the femur and the uh, acetabulum. And then here's another one. There's reduced joint space on the inferior aspect of the femoral head. Here's a normal hand x-ray, and what I want you to pay attention to here are the distal and proximal interphalangeals. And notice how uh, each interphalangeal uh, joint is relatively symmetrical. They look the same on both sides. When you get osteoarthritis, you get uh, remodeling of the distal and proximal interphalangeal joints, and that remodeling will cause those nodes that we talked about. So here uh, on the distal interphalangeal joint of the uh, second digit, you have a Haberdin's node, which is just a node on the distal interphalangeal joint. Haberdin is a distal uh, node. And then here you've got, uh, here's an, n another one. Uh, this, this should be red to indicate that this is a uh, Haberdin's node. Here you have a Bouchard's node, or what might possibly be a Bouchard's node. Uh, I, I didn't see these, I only see the x-rays, so it's uh, kind of a hard diagnosis to see without seeing the patient's hand but this looks like a node to me. And then here you can see on the uh, distal interphalangeals, you see some definite narrowing in joint space. So here's uh, what these patients' hands may look like uh, on the outside. And uh, these are uh, Bouchard's nodes. Here are the distal, or sorry, Haberdin's nodes, distal interphalangeal, it's easy to get those mixed up. A burdens is distal interphalangeal no nodes, so you've got practically one on each finger here. Notice here, particularly on the right, third, fourth, and fifth digit. And then these are the Bouchard's nodes, and you also see some Haberdin's nodes here. Okay. So how do we treat osteoarthritis? It is a palliative treatment. So we cannot reverse the progress of osteoarthritis. It is a degenerative disease. So the therapy is primarily palliative in reducing the pain and in maximizing the patient's functional capacity. As I mentioned, osteoarthritis is a common cause of disability. And so we want to maximize these patients' ability to function in the outside world. As far as pain, NSAIDs are the mainstay of treatment. We use prescription strength NSAIDs, so various drugs would be ibuprofen, uh, uh, ketoprofen, meloxicam, diclofenac, and celecoxib. Celecoxib is a COX-2 inhibitor, and that would be a drug of choice if the patient has ulcer disease. COX-2 inhibitors only work on the COX-2 enzyme, so they provide the same pain relief as the non uh, Cox specific uh, inhibitors, but they do carry an increased risk of cardiovascular events. So that's something that you have to weigh. But you would definitely want to use a Cox 2 inhibitor in a patient with a history of uh, ulcer disease. No one NSAID is better than the other. Acetaminophen is the treatment of choice in any patient who's sensitive to NSAIDs and topical capsaicin is found to be useful uh, but in some patients, but it's inferior to NSAIDs. So what you should know for the USMLE is that NSAIDs are the mainstay of treatment. In some patients, physicians will do uh, intra-articular injections. Uh, they can use either uh, topical, uh, 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 they can use topical drugs to reduce pain or they could uh, actually inject steroids. Um, though that is not the treatment of choice for osteoarthritis. Even though you may see it done, you may even do it, that's not the treatment of choice for osteoarthritis. NSAIDs are the treatment of choice for osteoarthritis. Additional non-pharmacologic therapies for osteoarthritis would include occupational therapy to get these patients functioning uh, at home, uh, maximize their quality of life. Weight reduction, of course, in any obese patient, particularly if they have osteoarthritis of the knees and of the hips, Weight reduction is going to be very helpful. Hot and cold compresses can be useful for reducing inflammation uh, as an external method. Exercise as tolerated and physical therapy can be useful for osteoarthritis as well. But do remember for the USMLE that NSAIDs are the mainstay of treatment. And that is it for osteoarthritis.